Look, plain and simple, our members want to hear it, so we're going to say it. Look, if this was a police officer, she'd be pounding the table trying to throw that officer in jail. Yep. She'd want to terminate them, she'd want to publicly humiliate them, and she'd want them off the job tomorrow. But for some reason, the double standard, like always when it comes to certain city councilors and certain elected officials, there's nothing to see here, folks. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I read that in the paper, and I almost want to laugh. She is not sorry. All right, everybody, welcome. Time once again for the official podcast of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. We call it Answering the Call. My name is Jamie Keneally, alongside, as always, the president of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association, Larry Calderon. Larry, good to see you. Likewise, Jamie. Ready to go. Uh, as always, Larry, we like to kick off the show uh, with showing some love to the hardworking men and women of the BPD. Uh, so, again, I hand it over to you. Yeah, just a normal thanks for everything they do, Jamie. They're uh, continuing to work hard day and night. And now the summer season has kicked off. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get into it, but the, the doubles are nonstop. I even had a, a triple order over holiday weekend. But uh, just a thank you to the hard work for the men and women that they do out there every day. Yeah, and we, we'll certainly get to that in a second. Also coming up later in the show, special guest Mike Dukakis to talk about his uh, not yet recent comment about saying when he said defunding the police is nuts. We appreciated that. We'll talk to Mike about that. Uh, but first, obviously, contract negotiations. It's it's the issue on everybody's mind. Just to catch people up, as of June 1st, three years without a contract, correct? July 1st. July, July, excuse me, July 1st, three years without a deal. So three years of Stagnant wages, no pay raises, and again, as most of our members know, filed for JLMC in December. They took jurisdiction in May, and again, the big question, uh, and I know you hear it all the time, but how how long do you think it will take before we can uh, a deal can be can be done? Well, it's going to be another few months, Jamie. I know uh, previous podcasts uh, we've spoken about a timeline. We were hoping to have this wrapped up by the end of the year. I still see that as the possibility, and that is our goal. We're hoping by Christmas that we will have an award, a big pay raise, full retroactive pay, and a good Christmas for our members and their families. And again, just real quick, the issues remain the same. You touched on them, wages, residency requirement, educational incentives, schedule, and an enhanced uh, detail system with a better pay structure. Speaking of uh, detailed pay increases, superior officers, just got one. And the obvious question, how did they get one? And, and, and how does that, I guess, help us in, in, in our negotiations? A uh, simple answer, Jamie. They, they received the pay raise in the public safety detail system because they have language in their contract like the majority of police organizations in the Commonwealth. So it is collectively bargained. It is in their CBA. That is something that I've been beating the drum on since I was elected president. The BPPA must achieve getting public safety detail language as a part of our contract. And we are going to do that when this contract arbitration is over. Never again will we be at the uh, hope, whim, and deal-making or shove down our throats uh, pay raises by any commissioner in the future. It'll be part of our contract. It's just, it, it, it just to echo that point, Larry, yeah, you, you've been making that point over and over again. It just makes sense. And you're right. Why leave it to at the whim of the commissioner when you can have it written up? You've been saying that all along. Correct. You look at us. So we've been around 25, 30 years and um, we have two, maybe three pay raises in the public safety detail system. And every time we get screwed, every time we have to give something major up, whether it's an 18 hour rule, a cut to the hours yep. worked, et cetera. In, in case people don't know, we have one of the worst, if not the worst detail uh, pay rates in, in the state. We are the third lowest in the state. Yeah, nothing to be proud of there. Uh, of course, let's, um, you know, when we talk about JLMC taking jurisdiction for simplicity's sake, just to give people some, you know, an idea of the roadmap. Uh, step one, mediation, right? Correct. And then step two, well, then pre-arbitration, then arbitration. Yeah, we, we can go through with the, the filing, acceptance by JLMC, mediation meetings to hammer out what we can at the table. Uh, arbitrator picked. Yep. Testimony from both sides, myself, the mayor's team. Um, our team, the mayor's team, uh, will give testimony, will articulate why we deserve what we're asking for, and then an arbitrator has 60 days to write it up after the fact. We're in the mediation phase right now? Or we, are, we are in the mediation phase now. We are awaiting the city to give us some dates and uh, to let the membership know what we've been telling them all along. And again, at the roll calls that uh, Chris, myself, you, and others are visiting, 
Not too much happens during the summer months. Right. Attorneys on both sides are on vacation. It's difficult to get meetings. So we will be um, hitting the road hard and fast right after Labor Day in September. We expect a meeting or two uh, in, uh, excuse me, uh, in August. We're, we're expecting JLMC to give us a couple of days for mediation. But again, we have to await the city on that. And uh, typical games that they play is all the attorneys are on vacation for right. four to six weeks during the summer. So again, after Labor Day, it'll be fast running hard, but I do believe that we will have an award by the end of the year and payment for Christmas. But to underscore that point, though, fact-finding takes time. The back and forth takes time. You know, agreeing on the issues takes some time. Well, it does. In mediation, uh, there's a couple of things that uh, I know that we know um, are possible to hammer out the table, but when it gets to the arbitration, uh, there's a lot of testimony that goes on, and it takes time to make sure that we are thorough in how we put forward our argument, whether it's equal educational benefits for pre- and post-Quinn or uh, changing the language to the, to the MIS language that's currently in the contract as it relates to pay raises for education, uh, residency that we're looking to get rid of altogether. Yep. Yep. So, so it takes time on each topic to make sure that we are clear on our side of the table. We want to make it crystal clear to the arbitrator why we deserve better wages, why we deserve to be compensated like the fire department across the street, like our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in Cambridge, Brookline, Quincy, the state police. Yeah. Uh, I have that knowledge. We have that knowledge. And we are going to win a very good contract yeah. at the end of this. And, and you've said it a bunch of times. It's worth saying again, you know, uh, in answer to the question, are, are our men and women going to get paid? Yes, they are. Awesome. All right. Um, once the agreement is reached, so the award is 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 reached, I guess, um, binding, right? It's binding for us and the mayor. The mayor. The, the mayor's job is to uh, then lobby the city council to pass it. Our job is to make sure, as we put the argument forward, that we can, again, articulate the city's ability to pay the wages and yep. the increases in benefits that we're asking for. Uh, we have hired outside counsel, as everybody knows, to yep. help us achieve that. We hired an economist. We know the city has the money for what we are asking and well beyond. So it's not like we're bankrupt in the city. We are looking to be fairly compensated. Money's there. Again, yep. like the fire department across the street, our brothers and sisters across sure. the water. Sure. So it's plenty of money. Uh, again, we feel good about it by the end of the year. Hopefully, everybody will be smiling and having a good Christmas. Well, there's, there's also the extra step of the council. Obviously, the mayor has to sell it to the council. The council has to vote on it. And what's been going on these last couple of weeks, the question that we keep getting time and time again is, should the council even be allowed to vote on the on the, the award? And, and let me just real quick, Larry, throw a couple of things. Kendra Lara, obviously, big story. Um, in, in an answer, it's a fair question. Should he should she be allowed to vote on the contract? Most know the story, traveling at a high rate of speed. Um as in, as in, like double the speed limit, possibly sixty miles per hour in a twenty-five mile per hour zone, middle of the day, deeply uh, populated residential neighborhood, loses control of a car, hits a house. Oh, by the way, no license; it's revoked. Driving an unregistered, uninsured motor vehicle, and, and the worst part is, you know, she had her seven-year-old son in the back seat without a, a a booster seat. I guess it is. But is is it fair for members to say to you, hey, who who is she to to vote on our contract given? Her, her, her pretty obvious lack of judgment. Wow, so many, so many things that I can say to hit on that, Jamie. Yeah. Uh, should she be allowed to? Probably not. Uh, legally, she has the right to, to vote on the contract. Uh, touching upon, look, plain and simple, if this was a police officer, she'd be pounding the table trying to throw that officer in jail. Yep. She'd want to terminate them, she'd want to publicly humiliate them, and she'd want them off the job tomorrow. But for some reason, the double standard, like always when it comes to certain city councilors and certain elected officials, there's nothing to see here, folks. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I read that in the paper, and I almost want to laugh. She is not sorry. Neither is Tanya Fernandez-Anderson. Neither is Julia Mejia. These city councilors that berate, humiliate, and continually condemn our police officers like they did at the Bruce Boland building as they tried to take away our current public safety detail system, um, they're full of it. And they're full of themselves. She hasn't had a license 
for seven years. She's been driving to City Hall since she's been elected a city councilor. Give me a break. Yep. Yeah. So the double standard, well and alive. Uh, and again, if this was a police officer, they'd be humiliating yep. that officer publicly. But, I mean, do but, as I say, not as I do. Yeah. It's like the high standard should certainly apply to us and certainly to to her. Uh, speaking of, of Kendra Lara, we did endorsements recently. We should probably mention the fact that we endorsed her, her challenger, Will King, in District 6. And since we're talking about endorsements, we also endorsed uh, Aaron Murphy again, Johnny Fitz. John Fitzgerald is running to replace Frank Baker. And, and, and in, in District 5, the district for Ricardo Arroyo, we're obviously endorsing Jose Ruiz, a recently retired Boston police officer. Yeah, I, I can't say this strongly enough to the members that are listening to the podcast. Uh, first, thank you for doing so again. But let's make sure that we get out the vote. Make sure that you cast a ballot in any of these city council district elections in which you, your family, your friends and others reside. Get the word out. Uh, when you talk about um, Council Laura, whether it's Will King or anybody else, you should be pulling a lever for whomever else is running against Kendra Lauer. Uh, and let's touch, let's go right to a royal. He's the same. Yep. These, these, these are councilors that sit up there and continually berate, humiliate, and try to defund this police department, the yep. same police department that provides them with the protections, the safety, and and quite frankly, the enjoyment that they have every day in their neighborhoods. And they make a mockery of what we do. It's There's, there's just no room for it, Jamie. There's no place for it. Ooh. Neither one of them... Have it have the integrity to vote on the council? Uh, excuse me, to vote on the contract. Right. Neither one of them have the integrity to be an elected official yep. at City Hall, but legally they have the right to vote on it, and hopefully the voters will throw them out. But since we're, we're talking about Ricardo, it should be noted. Like again, the hypocrisy is off the charts. Everybody's well aware of the multiple sex assault allegations, the election tampering and collusion with the U.S. Attorney uh, Rachel Rollins, and the recent state ethics violation, which resulted in a three thousand dollar fine. And again, the mayor herself, Larry, says the credibility of these elected officials is, is, is compromised. So uh, again, you know, should they be allowed to judge us when they're unwilling to judge themselves? It's it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, again, the quick answer is no, they shouldn't. And uh, hey, kudos to the mayor. Um, you know, finally, she's coming out and saying something that uh, is a little bit more accurate. And instead of standing behind Councillor O'Royo and endorsing him, which I know she pulled that endorsement after the fact, but yep. instead of endorsing him, hey, she's calling it like she sees it. Yep. Look, the, the guy has compromised integrity. He should not be reelected. Yep. Jose Ruiz is an upstanding community Stunned. member. He's he's born, raised, and advocates for others in the community. Um, he's a former police officer, and he's here for public safety and his community. Yep. It is a no-brainer, no matter who he runs against, never mind Ricardo Arroyo. But the buzzwords, Larry, accountability, transparency. Again, they apply to everybody else, I guess, but uh, except, Lara, the yeah, except, except, right, except the city council. Except some city council. Other news, of course, we want to get, we got Michael Dukakis coming up, but um, other news, not good news, Larry. Another case of an officer being ordered to work 24 hours happened over the weekend. There's been some, you know, pushback by the department about whether the officer was ordered or volunteered, but either way, it's 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 almost irrelevant. It's semantics. You still have police officers working 16, 20, uh, 20 hours a day, underscoring the severe staffing shortage issues. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, you, you got to hire more. But, you know, what are you, what are your thoughts, Larry, on how to re resolve this issue? And, and the fact that once again, we have another officer working way too many hours. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah first, the, the simple answer is what you heard me say in the media, uh, on the radio shows, on TV, in the newspaper. They need to get rid of residency. Uh, this gaffe I saw the other day by the commissioner saying that he's exploring leaving civil service. Give me a break. All you need to do is get rid of the residency policy. We had 63, if that number is correct, 63 lateral transfer candidates already trained, already paid for, already police officers come here when they had the lateral transfer opening. 
and 51 of them got up and left the room because the department told them point blank they are not lifting the residency. you got to move into the city. Right. No one wants to live at 8.5% inflation, $900,000 median prices to purchase a home in the city of Boston with completely failing school systems and a city council that's looking to defund defund the police police department. Please take details away. Residency, I mean, you said it, though. They set aside 50 spots for lateral transfers, trained police officers ready to hit the street running, and three of them said yes, the other, and I know there were more, but they set aside spots for 50, said, no, it's too expensive. We can't afford to live in your city. What more evidence do you need? And and before you go on, you know, uh, you asked me also, what can we do? You can't hire your way out of this. Kudos to City Councilor uh, Ed Flynn, probably our loudest and biggest advocate over the last two years. He's been great. He needs, he's been saying publicly, you need to hire 300 police officers a year for the next five years. Yep. It reminds me of when you and I came on the job during the Clinton days and we had the community policing grants. We can't hire enough bodies fast enough. We have 125 in the academy, as the department liked to put out just the other day, uh, pretending that that's going to build our ranks. Well, we do. We have 125 in the academy, but we're on pace to retire 95 this year. So we're going to plus 35 bodies. What's that? One per shift per station. The audacity of this command staff and this police department right now to mislead the general public every day that they can, whether it's the third tour semantics. That's great. Mary Ellen Burns is in the paper trying to pretend that it's okay for a police officer to be given the opportunity to work more than 18 hours straight. No one should ever work three tours in a row. No one should work 24 hours straight, never mind a police officer. And shame on this department, Mary Ellen Burns, all the way to the police commissioner, to try to pretend that they didn't order those bodies. All of the bodies in those stations were on doubles, like they are every day that they come to work. A police officer comes in on day one of his four or her four, and they know they're not going home until the 16 and a half hour clock is done. So shame on the department for misleading the public. And as you can hear, raising my blood pressure. At, at you and, and the 1,400 police officers who, who don't get to go home at the end of a 16-hour shift. All right, speaking of comments and comments we liked, uh, Mike Dukakis not too long ago said defunding the police is nuts. He's right. And, and he, coming up after the break, we'll sit down and talk to Mike about what we can do to make policing more attractive um, today. Coming up after the break. All right, welcome back, everybody. Super excited about our, our guest on uh, uh, this month's podcast. He's Brookline born, Brookline high educated. We're speaking to Michael Dukakis, three term, three time governor, uh, presidential nominee, and four. So, uh, did you confirm four sport athlete at Brookline High? Is that what you're saying? You fl- you played four sports? Well, when when the two guys who were ahead of me, yeah, were sick. as catchers, uh, you know, kind of took their their place in the team, uh, I figured it was time to try something else. And, and of course, I, I, you know, catching a swinging strike was a, was a, was a, was not something that people did easily in those days. Yeah. So listen, yeah. we, we got you on the show and we're, we're grateful to you first and foremost, and especially for the comments Happy you to made. Do it. Yeah. The comments Fire you made, um, you know, you, you were the one at a time, obviously the defund the police movement has been, um, we like to think it's on fumes, but you were one of the first, Noteworthy elected officials that come out and say it in, in your words were defunding the police is absolutely nuts. And in saying yeah. that, of course, you, you know, you captured exactly what we've been saying all along because we couldn't believe you know, like we, we, we couldn't agree with you more. It's absolutely nuts. But what made you say it when you did? What made us what made it say what made me say it was because uh, we need excellent policing in our communities. And fortunately, Massachusetts has that. Yeah. And you guys are a very important part of that. Um, uh, you know, you, 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 this defunding the police thing doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean that you don't want excellent policing. I'm a great believer in community policing. We do that very well here. And uh, there's a history, as you guys all know, of that goes back uh, uh, several, several de- decades where we finally, you know, began getting seriously involved in, uh, in, in community policing. And uh, we should be doing that all the time and training our cops to, to do it and do it well. I think we have, uh, we've still got things to do. And, 
I'm about to turn 90, but wow. as long as I'm walking around here, uh, I want to be as effective as I can in, in urging folks to do it. I, I don't think that most Massachusetts residents understand that we're the safest state in the country. Barack Obama, of course, we always quote Barack Obama in 2015 talking about how Boston has one of the best community policing departments and models in the country. He had said it before. You're saying it and you've continued to say it. But and again, the obvious question and you're you're in a great position to answer. How important is public safety to a city that wants to be successful? I mean, how how big a role does public safety play for cities that want to be yeah places that that attract people to live? It's at the top of the list, but um, one of the things we got to watch is kind of getting out there and starting telling people how wonderful we are. Uh, you know, this is an ongoing, you folks know this better than anybody. Yep. This is an ongoing job that has to be done, done on a very, very intensive and, 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 and effective basis. And um, I'm very proud of the fact that I live in, a, in the safest state in America. Let, let's stop you on that because that's that's an issue that we deal with all the time. I mean, you, you know, the the, the this, you know, the profession has been professionalized. We've attracted some bright minds. The education level has never been yep. higher. Now we're having difficulty recruiting. What do you do uh, to make sure that it doesn't go down in the wrong direction? How do you continue to attract people to do this you, job? What's, you go at it intensively. First, you let people know how good our police are in this in this in in this state i mean that's so important yep it's a calling um and and uh you know we 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 just thanks to all of you and uh and citizens who 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 support you um we've got a remarkable record here which i think uh, not many Massachusetts people really are aware of. When I say to people, you know, we're the safest state in the country, I didn't know that. And, and, and we couldn't, again, agree with you more. There's a lot to be proud of. Um, okay. There's always room for awesome. reform. But let me ask you, uh, Mike, about uh, somebody who you kind of gave, I guess, his first big job to. And, and, and he's done a lot as it relates to, you know, the model of community policing, relationship building, the respect that, that comes from it. Bill Bratton was a guy you eyeballed early on. Thoughts yeah. on thoughts on Bill Bratton? I got mad at him because he went off to New York. <laughs> <laughs> I said to him, I never forget. I picked up the phone. I called him. I said, "Hey, Bratton, you told me that this was your dream job when he became commissioner. Yeah, what are you doing going to New York?" Yeah, and he you, said, "Look, if I can, right. well, he, he did say, look if." If I can prove what I'm talking about in New York, it'll transform policing. He goes down there, cuts the homicide rate, which at that time was two and a half thousand. He cuts it in half, and Giuliani fires him. <laughs> yeah, he was getting too I much. Guess, he was stealing guess, the spotlight. I guess because Bratton made Time Magazine, and he didn't. I don't know what. Uh, yeah, I think that was, it. was That was a big part of it. Let me ask you this too, Mike. I mean, it. When you when you talk about politics or or in policing, um, for both, it, it, it's it's you know it's a chance to help people. Whether you're a politician or a police officer, it's a chance to help people. No question, it's a calling for sure. Do you see parallels between though the the, the two professions? Yeah, both. I mean we're in, we're in the helping professions. We're out there trying to make life better, safer. Um, you know, more promising for our citizens. And uh, there's no question in my mind that what you folks have been doing makes a great difference when it comes to people. I mean, folks aren't pouring in here as tourists, tourists just, you know, for the history. Right. They're coming in because this state has a reputation for not only treating people well, but but, uh, creating... A, an environment in which folks can walk around. They can, they, people aren't, you know, scared to get out the street and, and, uh, and enjoy and enjoy the state. When people talk about Mike Dukakis, they talk about a guy uh, whose glass has always been half full. And morale is certainly an issue. 
for for police officers. So to the young police officers out there, and he's trying to maintain, you know, that that healthy level of optimism. You know, what do you yeah. say to the police officer who might, you know, need 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 a pick me up or a boost? How do you, you know, protect let's, and maintain that optimism? Let's sit down, discuss it, and go to work on it, and get your input into how we make it better. Defunding the police is nuts. We could not agree with you more. And we certainly thank you for your time, sir. Uh, it's been awesome to catch up, and we look forward to to talking again. So, uh, Governor Michael let Dukakis. Me, let, thanks, Jamie. Let me, let me know what I can do to be helpful. I mean, I'll be, I'll be 90 in a few months, but I'm still going strong, Incredible. all things considered. Well, happy birthday <laughs> if we don't talk before then. But again, Thanks. thank you, sir, for coming on the show. We appreciate it. And we can, we, we, Thanks, Governor, we'll, we'll call you the day after my birthday in November, and we'll say happy birthday for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you again, Governor. We appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Okay, bye okay. now. Thanks, Thanks talk Governor. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Mr. Dukakis, for coming on the show. And, of course, to our, our followers, uh, we appreciate the feedback and the show uh, guidance. So thank you for listening. Uh, Larry, last word to you. No, just again, thank you to the men and women that are out there. I try to spend as much time as you can with your family. And you know my motto, if that means you don't feel well and you need to take the benefits extended through the collective bargaining agreement, you do so. Spend some time at home. Mental health is needed for everyone. Be safe. Yeah, no, such, no such thing is too much. All right, I'm Jamie Keneally. Till next time, everybody, keep up the great work and stay safe. <laughs>